Thanks for having me. I apologize to everybody about the scheduling, but I got hit with COVID Monday and uh, we, we were supposed to do this Tuesday, I think, and my voice was just not up to it. And as you can hear right now, it still has not fully recovered, but uh, I'm on the four days in, so I think I'm almost over it. But, oh, uh, but thanks, Greg, for joining us. No, you know, I know it's COVID sucks, so, you know, really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, this one, uh, it, you know, aches and fever and chills, but then it hit me mm -hmm. in the chest and, you know, just it's hard to talk and, you know, go without coughing and hacking for a few minutes, but uh, feeling pretty good right now, so I think we can get through it. But yeah, long story short, serial entrepreneur, real estate investor and developer, so uh, bought, developed, and sold over $250 million in real estate using my own funds, uh, and then, you know, hundreds of millions with uh, partners and investors, and then, you know, started, exited, uh, started, scaled, and exited, you know, 12 different companies. And, uh, you know, for, I don't know, four or 500 million in value there. And, uh, you know, generally reinvest all the profits in real estate. So, you know, that's me. Long story short, I joined the Navy right out of high school. I didn't go to college. So I learned everything the hard way. Uh, very self-educated, even though I'm not formally educated. Uh, I've, I've educated myself and I continue to every day. And, uh, you know, and I coach and mentor people all around the world doing all kinds of different things, uh, real estate operators, uh, you know, business operators, people that have exited companies with significant uh, sums of money, helping them manage and navigate the uh, global macroeconomic climate. So currently, uh, you know, I do fewer, bigger deals in terms of real estate, and then I invest in markets and crypto, got into crypto a few years ago. Uh, so doing a little bit of everything and, you know, just uh, kind of enjoying life. Right. And you actually, on the on the crypto part, you actually speak about like Bitcoin and, you know, other crypto cryptocurrency on your YouTube channel as well. You know, I say you guys make make sure to check Greg's YouTube channel, which is uh, I think has great value and content there. And um, yeah, right, yeah. So so that that's imp that's impressive. So how did you start into real estate first? I guess um, like did you go to bigger deals right away, or did you kind of first do like single family and other investing? Like what was your path that way? I guess. Yeah, I started small. I started as a little remodeling handyman contractor, and. Um, you know, so my first deal that I got into was a lot flip that a friend of mine was a realtor and, uh, you know, I uh, had made some money and was, you know, somewhat successful. And he said, look, uh, we've got this lot, we can buy it. My dad has a client that, that'll that buy it from us and you put up the money, I'll do everything else. So we did that. And, and uh, you know, it was like a hundred thousand dollar lot purchase or something, flipped it, made 15 grand a piece. And I was like, wow, this is great. In like 30 days, you know, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then as a builder, you know, started as a little remodeling handyman contractor, started that company uh, from scratch, just me, my own truck, you know, my tools, doing whatever I could do myself, built that into a $30 million building company in seven years, sold it, uh, and used all the money to reinvest in other real estate deals, started 12 other companies during that time period, built them all up, sold them off. And um, I started working for other investors and other developers, and I started going from remodeling. So I had investors that were coming down to the area I was in. They were buying these big you know, beach houses on the Outer Banks of North Carolina, uh, multi-million dollar beach houses. They'd hire me to do an addition, put a pool in, do whatever. And then they would either rent them or sell them. And uh, I started watching what they were doing. And I said, hey, I want to get into some of these deals. And they said, well, you know, let's see how you do. And maybe we'll you know, teach you how to do this. And then they started building spec houses and I learned how to build spec houses. So that's kind of how I got started. And then as I scaled, you know, that I started getting into land development. What I realized was the money was in the dirt, not the vertical. The vertical was to extract the value out of the dirt. So uh, I started going after land deals and started doing more land development, mixed use subdivisions, commercial buildings, you know, bigger deals. And I kind of grew my network and the people that I was working for were all, you know, bigger developers that were doing hundreds of millions to billions of dollars, you know, a year in development deals. Some of them were worth four or 500 million. A couple of them were, were billionaires, two of the largest developers in our region. And my region is from North Carolina to DC. So I was doing a lot of work for big developers coming out of DC, Richmond, you know, the Hampton Roads area that were buying beach property, you know, down on the Outer Banks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of how I learned the trade. And uh, that's where I kind of first started learning the secrets of, you know, the billion dollar deals, the billion dollar portfolios is, you know, you just, you don't know what you don't know. And, you know, you're only limited by what you know, when you know it, and the vehicle that you apply it to. And that's really the difference between anybody doing a single family deal or doing, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in transactions to a billion dollar portfolios. It's all a matter of what you know, what you apply it to and when. Mm -hmm. And so do you want to dig into that, that a little more? And even it's to me, like even the way you started with like having a your your own contractor company, but actually selling it for 30 million valuation. So that in itself, 
it's like it's a big accomplishment for many contractors considering like even valuation multiples in in what is like kind of like construction company space so what was your strategy to be able to do that and sort of like build a business that is you know it's not tied to yourself if you will that is something that a new buyer can come in and and pay a you know top dollar for that so so, uh, you know, I was very fortunate, like I said, you know, very self-educated and I learned early on through, you know, developing myself, reading books, you know, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That was one of the first mm -hmm. books I read, did retail in the Navy. So I got some little bit of business training in the Navy. When I got out, I worked in the restaurant industry. So I got some good management, leadership management training in the restaurant industry. Uh, and then, you know, one of the first investing books I read, or you want to call it investing was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And what I got out of that was I wanted to be Rich Dad. So I didn't want to be Robert Kiyosaki. I didn't get real estate out of that book like a lot of people do. Um, I got, I want to be Rich Dad. He was the guy that was, you know, had all the businesses, was doing all the deals, but he didn't run anything. Everything was coming to him. <clears throat> the deals were coming to him. The people were coming to him. The opportunities were coming to him. He, he oversaw a portfolio of things, but he did it all through other people. And that's where the light bulb went off to me. And that's what I started doing. So my first company, I'd never built a house before I started building million dollar beach homes. So what I, what I did was, number one, I picked a name that I knew I could sell. So whenever you start any business or do any venture, you always have an exit strategy. Everybody exits. Everybody liquidates. It's just a matter of when and how. Mm -hmm. So when you start with that end in mind, I know I'm going to sell. I know I'm going to liquidate. I know I'm going to exit. Then you want to build a brand that's not tied to you personally in that regard um, you know, versus like an influencer brand or something. But you know, from a company standpoint, you want to build a brand that can stand alone without you and your name. And uh, you want to put people, processes, systems in place so that that business runs better without you than it does when you're there. And that's the true mark of a great leader, how well your organization runs when you're not around. It should run better uh, when you're gone. Yeah, if you've got the right people, the right systems, the right processes. And my philosophy in business was always people, operations, profit. Focus on the people. They will take care of the operations. The profit will be there. So that's kind of how I did that. So when I first started building, like I said, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't, I'd never built houses. I went and hired the best people I could find and mm -hmm. brought them in to run it. Case in, you know, point that I always use is, you know, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They wanted to win a Super Bowl, right? What do they do? They go get the best quarterback in the world. They bring him in and they put him at quarterback. They didn't bring him in and put him a wide receiver. They didn't bring him in and put him on defense. They said, we want to win Super Bowls. Let's go get the guy that knows how to throw touchdowns that will get us to the Super Bowl. They bring him in and they let him do his job. So that's how I built my companies was through it with and through other people like that. Let them do it. And every business I built, the end goal was to exit. And, you know, multiples were different back then than they are now. I think that was a three or four X multiple back then, you know, for a building company, you know, pre, you know, end of the year when liquidity was flowing, you could have exited one for probably 10 or 12, but now you're back down to three or four again. So, uh, you know, that's just, that's kind of how that went down. Mm -hmm. So you essentially, so you wanted to be like the, to reach that in the book and kind of be like private businesses, um, kind of build private businesses that work on their own, that are structured, not just on their own, but that would work even better when you're not there, right? And so forth. And like with exit strategy. And so that was really, it's, it's really kind of a private equity, private businesses, but perhaps private equity kind of mindset. Where yeah, it was all it was all private yeah. equity and, you know, build great businesses that generate mm -hmm. cash flow to invest in other assets. I mean, that was really my my theory, my thesis, my system. And mm -hmm. I did that over the years. The problem was all I knew was what I knew. So I didn't know back then how much I could have really done, you know, mm -hmm. and how much further I could have really gone because I was just starting from scratch. I didn't know anything. I had no mentors. You know, YouTube wasn't a thing. You, but, you know, you just really couldn't look this stuff up. And there was nowhere to get this kind of information from people like me. So, you know, I did what I knew how to do. And it was small companies, you know, 30 million here, you know, 10 million there, 5 million here, stuff like that. <clears throat> you know, those are small in the whole scheme of things when you're in the world of unicorns that we are today, where everybody's exiting for a billion dollars. But again, that was a, you know, mm -hmm. pre-2022 uh, <laughs> liquidity drain process, you know, it's a different environment now, but. Uh, you know, I just didn't know those things. And, you know, knowing what I know now, going back then, I would have been more on the hunt for a unicorn than I would, you know, an electrical company or a you know plumbing company or a building company. Mm -hmm. So what was your lesson? Camp? What was your insight into that? Like, what would you do now, basically, let's say, in terms of to try to scale a, a larger business or, or a business that has 
what do they call it? kind of like a bigger market where like the total, what do they call it even like in business, doing like the total um, market is of a certain size and you kind of, you can tap into it and so forth. And what would be your, what that you would do now that you didn't do back then? So just go way bigger. <clears throat> I just didn't know back then how big you could really go and how much easier it is when you're going bigger, because there's a lot of, from an equity standpoint, private equity, there's a lot of funds out there that like to write big checks and you're solving. So, you know, when, when, it, when you say go big, that's, that's a lot. And this is the secret to the billion dollar operators. So when I say go big, it's more than just go do big deals. You want to solve big problems. And the most successful companies out there are solving big problems at scale. So, you know, I knew where there's a problem, there's an opportunity. And I, and I started out my career of solving problems. And that's how I started my original company. I had a problem and there was a problem in the market I was solving, the need for good contractors that would call you back and show up, you know, uh, but in this day and age, if you think big and you think how big of a problem can I solve, one of the biggest problems out there is there's a lot of capital still on the sidelines that needs good places to go. It needs good companies. It needs good solid operators and real estate deals. Uh, it needs, you know, good sponsors for different ventures to send big checks to. So if you're somebody that I can write a, you know, 50 or a hundred million or $300 million check to that, that's solving a big problem for me. Cause I got all this capital I got to push out there as an equity fund. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> so that's the big thing that a lot of people don't realize. A lot of people think, wow, I can, you know, I got to raise a hundred million. How am I going to raise a hundred million bucks? There's, there's equity funds out there that like to write hundred million dollar checks and it's easy for them. Makes it easier. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the big, biggest case in point in that is we work. Right. I don't know if you all know the WeWork story, but, you know, he solved a problem by giving big chunks of capital a place to go. And he put a good story behind it and he's doing it again. And he just mm -hmm. raised a three hundred million dollar raise after, you know, one of the biggest blow ups on Wall Street. But the reason is he's providing a place for that money to go. That equity fund has a lot of money they need to write. So whether it's real estate, whether it's a company, you know, no matter what it is, if you have if you're a good operator, you know what you're doing and you're a solid, sophisticated operator. And you've got big opportunities for capital to flow into. You're solving a huge problem out there right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's a great insight. And so essentially, going bigger makes it it's it's way easier to to sort of streamline the process by getting you know large capital checks and so forth. And that's I mean that's really the need that is out there. It's to distribute big capital. There's a need to distribute like small amounts of money within like you know, private equity firms and so forth. And so, yeah, so that so essentially it gets easier to to think bigger and do bigger things. And so, so that's a, that's a great great insight there. And and so what is so how what about like investing in like real estate or cryptocurrencies and other things that you did once you built that's like you exited your your construction company and you kind of like you started getting into other businesses as well, but you presumably needed to invest your capital somewhere. So did you invest it in passively in other private companies? Did you invest it in the real estate exclusively or what was your approach at the time? Yeah. So, I, you know, I've always managed my own fund, my own you know office. So I invest in deals directly myself. I'm not a passive investor. So, okay. you know, I'm either buying companies, scaling them, getting out or, you know, building and developing, you know, I'm, I'm a merchant developer. That's been my business model. So I build, sell, buy, renovate, sell, build companies, sell. So that's kind of me. I'm a, I'm a cash compounder. And then I'll store that wealth in other uh, more liquid assets like treasuries, bonds, you know, stocks, things like that. You know, knowing what I know now about Bitcoin and crypto back then, you know, 2008, nine, I would have just put it all in that, you know, and let it ride and got out in November, December and, you know, just wait for the next cycle. But, uh, you know, I didn't learn about crypto until a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And so, um, but when you say your own deals, so is it meaning like being a general partner or, or actually your own private? My deal? own deals. Yeah. My literally me, you know, so yeah, in yeah. the world of syndication, so if people are in syndication or whatever, you, you hear the term yeah. control. Hey, we control 10,000 units or, yeah. you know, uh, I own or whatever. People use all these terms, you know, with how they control or whatever. And what they might mean is they they've either put a little bit of money in a syndication that's, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, 10 million, 20 million, $50 million deal. So they'll claim that they control $50 million worth of real estate because they invested 10,000 bucks or a hundred thousand bucks or whatever. They may not have even invested. They might've brought four or five people and then put their money in it. And then they say, we mm -hmm. control. 
So no, I'm the owner sponsor, my, my deal, you know, my money. That's the way I've done most of my business. I'm signing the checks. I'm, I'm signing, you know, the bank loans. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, all my loans were non-recourse, but you still got to guarantee them. You know, you still have to guarantee them, even though they're non-recourse. But yeah, it's just me, my cash, you know, doing my own deals, that kind of thing. And then I would do joint ventures with other investors and, you know, things like that. My business model was always different because the investors that I've worked with over the years were a different level of liquidity. So that standard syndication model didn't fit what we were doing. It was more joint venture, you know, mm -hmm. uh, partner, you know, joint partnerships, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, consider like investing in private companies where you yourself through your knowledge attempt to affect their valuation and their exit strategy and so forth yeah well so that's what i did with other businesses so yeah, yeah. you know all of the businesses that i invested in were usually with somebody else sometimes okay. i would put cash in them and the intellectual uh -huh. capital sometimes it was just intellectual capital uh you know advisory and that type of thing so yeah that's how i did all the other businesses so when like i just literally went and started all these companies some of them were startups but they were always with other people Mm -hmm. Okay, understood, understood. So that's that's kind of, and that's the essence of a private equity investor, where you join in yourself through your knowledge or capital and so forth, but you kind of try to affect, my understanding, I might be wrong, you try to affect valuation yourself, you don't want to, you want to have this control of understanding how you're raising the value of that company and so forth. Yeah, that's me. Whenever I invest in something, I take control. So uh, okay. kind of like, you know, you've seen the show The Profit with Marcus Limonis, you know, when he comes in, he wants control. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a question on the chat. So Scott is asking, so can you give a few examples of the types of deals that you're investing in, type of business, capital required, cash flow exit strategy, etc.? Okay, just basically, if you can give us an example of perhaps a deal or type of deal that you're investing in. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, one of the most recent ones was just land development. So that was something I was focusing on over the last couple of years, buying large tracts of land, splitting them up and selling lots to builders. Now that business model's changed because builders aren't building now, the market's changed and I kind of saw that coming. But, you know, over the last few years, those are the types of things that I've been focusing on, uh, large land development projects, mixed use where you got a little bit of commercial, you've got some residential lots, you know, things like that. Um, you know, working on some ground up multifamily uh, um, deals around the country. So, I, you know, like I said, I coach and mentor people all over the place. So uh, I'm working with a lot of people doing a lot of different things right now. Several ground up multifamily deals. Um, I've got some doctors and uh, dentists I'm working with that are doing strip development, doing like um, strip centers that you would normally see like a Starbucks, Chipotle, you know, haircut but they're putting a, you know, dentist, orthodontist, pediatric dentistry, endodontist, you know, all that kind of thing and doing a dental strip and doing medical office complex tricks. You know, I had one of my clients, I coached through a deal the other day. It was a four office portfolio deal that he found. It was four medical office buildings. So it was about a $9.6 million portfolio deal. And uh, I helped him get that deal done without using any money down. And he ended up spinning out one of the properties and ended up with a hundred thousand dollars a year in positive cash flow and about a million in equity right out of the gate without using any money other than you know minor closing costs you know for recording title and all that so you know those are the types of things i'm working on and focused on right now with people all over the country just kind of kind of helping people learn how to do what i've done over the years mm -hmm. and would you do like would you consider like value add multifamily or perhaps kind of value add uh, triple net and maybe in like some of those deals or yeah, so I've got some people, not me personally, uh, I've got some people I'm working with doing the value add thing. And, you know, one of them I took from, I don't know, I think they had about 30 or 40, maybe 100 million in assets. Now they're at uh, almost a billion. And it was two doctors, had no team, no employees really to speak of. And I've scaled them into, uh, they're in the Inc. 500 now. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, they've, they've scaled their team up to 20 people. And I mean, they're just, they're really getting after it. And they're buying, you know, they've gone from doing 10 and $20 million deals to doing $100 million deals. And, you know, things like that. And it's all value add stuff. Some of it's core, core plus as they've grown, but, you know, some of them were, were bigger value adds along the way. But from my standpoint, what I love to do in that regard, I'm opportunistic. So I need a bigger lift than just your standard value add. So mm -hmm. I like to go in and like totally reposition a property. Like, yeah. you know, I like to buy old warehouses or things like that, or old buildings and repurpose them into something else, maybe condos, maybe mixed use, you know, things like that. Um, you know, you go into an urban core that's kind of revitalizing and you buy some buildings up and, you know, redevelop them. So, I mean, that's the kind of stuff I like to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So opportunistic. And in terms of 
So knowing the industry and in Europe, perhaps across like a, a, a few different a few different industries, but knowing real estate so well, like through various businesses within it and investing as well. So have you considered also investing in prop tech and like going more on the technology side? And have you done that? No, I haven't done any prop tech yet. <clears throat> I was actually, well, I was working with one company that was doing a real estate investor CRM mm -hmm. um, company and property intelligence company, but I haven't personally invested in any of those. Um, you know, that's a good space. There's a lot going on. There's a crypto facing company out there called uh, Proppy that's doing um, NFT, real estate NFTs. And, yeah, you know, know they're, they're trying to... Cool. Yeah. yeah, they're trying to streamline, you know, the transaction process there with blockchain technology. So to me, that's interesting in terms of the the whole NFT aspects of real estate and then taking real estate on chain, you know, to blockchain. So I think there's some exciting things coming in the real estate world with that. But, uh, you know, uh, you as like far as the, you do like the tokenization or perhaps not tokenization so much, but kind of improving the closing process through NFTs model that property has. Like and um, so, I well, I, I think what's interesting in me is just is is just you know our system of recordation of title and process is just you know all, everything's offline and so you know hard to get to just the way blockchain can put it all out there, uh, right. you know and and you know transparent is kind of interesting. You know I don't know how the NFT solution would solve not tokenization of real estate but NFTs. Yeah. Right. where you know the property itself becomes an nft so you don't need to do the right. title transfer all the time you're just selling an nft i mm -hmm. think that's interesting but i don't know how that can work with real estate because real estate is so different and unique and there's so many issues with title and boundaries and just all the things that you can have with real estate you know but that's an interesting thing an interesting problem that could be solved that's a big problem that could be solved you know somehow mm -hmm. down the road so let's say so we are talking today kind of like a like billion dollar operator secrets, right? So if we take, you mentioned blockchain, the supply to real estate potentially, let's say, um, and also like you discussed before Bitcoin that you would actually, you, you would have invested like more significantly in Bitcoin. So what is your, what is your thinking in terms of like investing strategy? Like what would you do now? Like what, what is your argument on Bitcoin that makes you so bullish there, let's say, and, um, you know, from the perspective of a person who has been so successful building up his network in kind of more secure private company controllable ways, let's say. Yeah. So, you know, let's qualify that. I'm not saying I'm bullish now at these prices <laughs> and, you know, in different levels. What I, what I said was back then, because you started basically from zero or a few cents and it went up to 60 grand. So, I mean, that's just unheard of. Although real estate's done that, you know, in, in, in certain areas. So you've, you've had returns but not in the same amount of time, you know, necessarily. But that's why, because it's just such an exponential technology. And so what's interesting about Bitcoin in and of itself is uh, the, you know, from the standpoint of it's a speculative asset, it's a risk asset. So I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist, right? I understand the technology, blockchain, blockchain all that, you know, it's a, you know, trustless system, you know, truly decentralized, you know, things like that. But what's interesting about, about the Bitcoin play itself is that, the network effect. So it's an emerging technology. It's only been around 10 years and it has, it has, you know, blown up exponentially in a quick time frame. And you have more institutional players interested in Bitcoin. Some Ethereum, when that switches to proof of stake, that might change. But right now, you know, Bitcoin is on the radar of a lot of institutional outfits. And, you know, BlackRock came out the other day, they're doing a deal with Coinbase, so they can bring in their institutional clients into it's either BlackRock or Blackstone. I get them confused all the time um, to bring their institutional clients in so they can get exposure to Bitcoin. So you've got more institutional people coming in. And, you know, Bitcoin is one of the more secure, safer networks. Obviously, it's instantly transfer transferable, um, you know, trustless, you know, open network, you know, all the different things about Bitcoin. And in terms of being bullish on it, once the price bottoms out, just like the market. So I'm in the markets too, especially with the volatility that we've had here lately, big moves. You know, we had a 30, 40%, you know, swing in some of the stocks here lately. Um, but once everything settles, once inflation plateaus, the Fed has finished their interest rate hike, we get, you know, QT resolving mm -hmm. and we can get back to a stable understanding of how mild or deep is this recession going to be and last 
the markets can then find the bottom and start reversing. And when that happens, you're going to have huge opportunities in markets. Generally, Bitcoin is, you know, 10x exponentially to the upside and to the downside of the markets, mm -hmm. as we've yeah. seen. You know, Bitcoin's down right. I don't know, 56, 65 percent right now or something. The markets are down 20 or 30. So, you know, it's it's two times as much right now, but it'll go, you know, 10x to the upside. And if you look at the bottom of 2020, you yes. know, Bitcoin, you know, 15x, you know, where the markets, you mm -hmm. know, didn't quite go that far. But that's what I like about it. And I think that, you know, given a normal environment, uh, getting back to, you know, more normal uh, global macroeconomic cycles, risks of war off the table in general, and, you know, we can get back to supply chain issues being resolved. I think you can see Bitcoin get back to, you know, 100 grand, you know, pretty quickly, uh, you know, going going in into a six month to a one year time frame. You know, I'm not one that thinks it's going to hit, you know, 500,000 or a million or 10 million or anything like that, you know, anytime soon, if in my lifetime. But I do see it getting back to 100,000 at some point once things kind of level off. Mm -hmm. And you did mention you kind of you focus on this kind of macro macro understanding of the economy and that. So, so what is your outlook on real estate now? And you know, real it's estate's in transition and mm -hmm. it's all interest rate related. So going back to 2008, nine, I, I had $30, $40 million worth of real estate, you know, in different processes back then. And, you know, I understood very intuitively back then it's all about interest rates. So it's, it's liquidity and it's interest rates. That's the two things that drive real estate. You got to have money to fund it. And then that cost of that capital affects the values. So right now, interest rates are going up, you know, especially uh, residential rates. They just went over 6% again. So we're seeing a correction in the housing market. We're seeing cap rates adjust nationwide uh, in the commercial and multifamily world because, again, it's cost of capital. And, uh, you know, you can only pay so much for an asset. It's got to be able to return. Um, so we're starting to see some adjustments. You know, how deep and how far that goes depends on how high the rates go. And it depends on the availability of the debt. And, you know, when the Fed starts unloading, you know, mortgage-backed securities from their balance sheet, that's going to put a lot of pressure on the debt and credit markets out there. So, mm -hmm. you know, the financing might be a little bit more expensive and a little bit more difficult. We're already seeing that. You know, the, the um, uh, agencies are, you know, strengthening and stiffening their requirements a little bit and, you know, scrutinizing deals and markets a little bit more and, you mm -hmm. know, those types of things, kind of like we saw in the pandemic. So, uh, right now, we just don't know how far, how deep this is going to go. It just all depends on how high the rates go, how much the Fed has to do, and you know how quickly we can recover mm -hmm. from the damage that they have to do to get things back under control because of you know everything that's been done since 2008-9. And that's really what we're doing. We're unwinding what's been done since 2008-9. You know, what four or five trillion dollars pumped into the economy, right. zero interest rates forever, yeah. and the biggest asset bubble. Yeah that we've ever seen in all assets all across the world. It's really amazing times. And yep. it's hard to believe we didn't get any inflation before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's like a very uh, quantitative easing period for a pretty long time. And so so it's interesting. So I'm, I'm not sure, like, I'm not knowledgeable if it's like the, indeed the biggest one or not, or but it's pretty distributed across assets and, you know, perhaps to a lesser extent in real estate than some others, but. But but still, and so like so, what's your view in the recession? Like considering that, so considering what you mentioned, there's some unwinding, uh, unwinding of kind of the massive central bank, um, you know, easing policy that they they've had for already 12 years and and more than that, and pretty much past the global financial crisis. And so like, what's your view in terms of um, actually, you know, declines that could happen? You know, everyone has like different views. Do you expect past the recession to see some declines in real estate, and if so, where in which market? So declines in what? In like real estate values. And do you oh, oh, values. values. Yeah, I mean, you know, real estate, it's hyper, yeah, it's hyper local, you know, so that you really can't give a, you know, real spectrum of that. Every market's different. Every asset's different. Every type's right. different. So it's really right. going to, gonna you know, vary greatly. And, you know, you can look at national averages and house prices aren't really coming down all that much. Yes. You know, they're actually still going up, you know, from a national average standpoint. Right. But certain markets, prices are down. And, and that's the thing. So prices are down in certain markets, but, you know, down from what? You know, really crazy prices yeah. they were listing at, you know? Yeah. So, uh, so let's talk about the commercial market because that's a little easier, right? Because yeah. cap rates kind of, yes. you know, work from geographic standpoints. And, you know, typically where you saw, you know, multifamily, for instance, in three, you know, two and a half, three, four cap, you know, you'll probably see that increase to, you know, three, three and a half, four, five cap, right? So it just depends on the city and the asset and things like that. 
Uh, you know, we're already seeing office cap rates, you know, get back close to 10% in some areas for some assets and some markets because, you know, office is struggling, um, yeah. you know, retail is struggling. So those assets are going to you know have really good cap rates. You're going to see those values get cut by 30, 40, 50%. You know, that kind of thing. We're seeing housing markets in some areas, Arizona, you know, Austin, Texas, um, you know, some places like that, that, you know, housing values are getting cut by 20 or 30 percent. But again, what number did that come from? It was an, you know, astronomically high number that never should have been there to begin with. So it's kind of coming back to you know, almost normal. Right. Right. Um, so it really depends and in, in, in what really happens and how how high these rates go and for how long. Okay. Okay, so let's open for questions. I don't want to, you know, <laughs> call it too long where we are also still recovering, right? From <laughs> I'm hanging in there pretty good. I'm kind of surprised. Doing, doing good, actually. That's true. So do you guys have, let's open up the floor for more questions. So do you guys want to, uh, you know, speak up, ask a couple of questions, or if you want to put them on the chat, they will relate as well. Yeah, Scott, go ahead. Hey, great presentation, Greg. Uh, thanks for being here. So I guess, I mean, I, I know no one has a crystal ball, but my question is just from someone like you who's been doing this for so long um, and now kind of forecasting like the rest of us that there's still some frothy times to come. Like, you know, I at this point, I know that like a lot of really sophisticated investors say that money is made in recessions. So like this could be really fertile times for a lot of millionaires to be made and a lot of really lucrative projects and, and investments um, to to kind of uh, begin. So like, what is your perspective on that? Like, are you going in pretty heavy right now and over the course of the next six to 12 months in, in any specific asset class? Like, do you have any, like, what is your standpoint on exactly how you're dealing with the times that we're living in and the fact that opportunities are starting to present themselves? Yeah, so I'm opportunistic. So I look for deep, you know, big opportunities. So I like to be in at the bottom. First time I invested in the markets ever, stock market was bottom of 2009. Never, never did it before till then. And I knew that was the time to go in because that was economic Armageddon. Everybody thought, you know, the stock market was going to just go to zero. So I look for those types of opportunities just where I'm at in the stage that I'm in now. I've been playing, you know, with the bear market since the, you know, November, December. And, you know, I called the top back then in you know pretty much everything and i've been kind of playing the bounces along the way so once i feel like we we've, we've reached bottom and i don't think we've reached bottom yet in the markets i could be wrong but i don't feel like we have um you know that's what i'll make some bigger moves in the markets and things like that as far as real estate goes you know i don't really look necessarily at the cycles you know although i do pay attention to the global macro picture but i look more at the asset and the opportunity itself so it's always a good time to buy the problem with a bear, bull market is, you know, you think you're a genius in a bull market when you're just lucky it's a bull market. So pre-2008-9, everything I touched turned to gold and I didn't think it would ever change. It just everything went up, everything worked. I had no clue that that could ever change. And then 2008-9 was a big, you know, awakening. The last couple of years, a lot of people that never went through anything like that, everything was easy. Everything was just going up. Didn't matter what you bought, everything went up. That's what I mean by the biggest asset bubble in all classes, real estate, stocks, crypto, everything was going up. Companies, equity, capital, multiples, you could buy any company at any multiple and then you could sell it to another equity shop for more money. So we're in a different environment now. So you gotta be real careful and you gotta look deal by deal, but there's deals out there. So depending on what your business model is, if you're opportunistic like me, you need to understand where the market is, where it could potentially go and it's risk reward, right? So if I'm gonna buy this building and renovate it and I think I can get, you know, $100 million for it. Well, if it traded at a three cap and, and, you know, which would make it 100 million, you know, last year, probably not going to trade at a three cap for 100 million this year, probably going to trade at a five cap. That's how I look at it. So I need to buy so I can trade at a five cap this year. Now, if you're buying income producing property and, you're, and your thesis is long term and you're not going to sell, then you pay whatever you want. It doesn't matter what you pay as long as you can service the debt and you know hit the cash on cash you're looking for or return you know the investment um you know target that you have with your investors if you're raising money from investors so you know that's why deals are continuing to get done because debt is still cheap in my terms i mean i was paying nine percent interest on all my construction loans you know back in the day when i was doing a lot more development so even at five or six percent that's still cheap 
So you just got to make sure that you're paying an appropriate amount so that you can service that debt and return on capital um, that you're targeting. So, you know, and as far as a company goes, you need to understand the shift that's going on, you know, in the consumer, you know, how people are consuming, where they're buying, what the opportunities are, you know, how technology is changing business. And if you're looking at those opportunities, you want to make sure you've got something that's going to, you know, be around for, for enough time to be able to exit that thing or do whatever it is you're going to do. And, you know, uh, with the employee situation that we're in right now, you have to, you know, understand what those costs are and what the opportunity costs are going to be of your time and capital, you know, trying to deal with those situations in this environment. So, you know, the good times never last, bad times never last. And there's opportunities in both. In a bull market, you lead the market up, you know, you buy here, you know, you're going to sell here. When it shifts, you lead the market down. It used to sell here and now it's going to sell here. So you got to buy down here, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to kind of stay ahead of the cycles. Right. Yeah, that's lead the market down, right? That's a great, great point. And um, and actually, I just want to add to what you mentioned, Greg, because with regards to like picking up a bottom after like after the peak, I just want to note like for most people, and that's just price history. So it, it typically took four or five years. That's not just the growth and because it actually took four or five years for extremely mild price declines after prior recessions, such as 1990, and still a five-year period to actually hit the real bottom. So it's, even if you have a 10% decline, it's quite interesting. And so that's, yeah, like it is. Say, it's actually a pretty lengthy process in real estate. It's not something I feel like a lot of people are feeling, oh, it's like, it's going to be like this year or next year or something. It's, it's typically not the case. Yeah, real estate's different. And, you know, the real estate syndication popularity over the last couple of years has kind of changed the game in real estate because it's so easy to raise capital and it's so easy to do big deals now. So that's really changed the game there. The housing market is different, you know, and that's a different animal. It's going to take a long time for the housing market to correct because this is nothing like 2008, nine for anything. Yes. We don't have a, we don't have a lending problem like we did back then. We don't have bad loans like we did. Commercials probably got more bad loans, especially multifamily because there's been a lot of interest only bridge debt that has been originated in the last two or three years where syndicators have come in, they paid too much for the properties. They've got interest only bridge debt that's coming due in the next, you know, couple, two, three years. So we might see some deals blowing up there. But, you know, the banks know how to handle that now. And there's operators out there that will take those assets over. So you're not going to see the damage in there like it was before in the housing market. The loans are healthy. I think like, you know, 70 or 80% of the loans are under 4%. They're qualified borrowers. They have high credit scores. They put big down payments. And, uh, you know, so, so the housing crash boroughs out there, you know, um, they're just not looking at the reality of the health of the housing market. There's no inventory. And sellers right now aren't going to sell when they're looking at 6% interest rates and no good options to buy where they're going. And they all can't rent. They're not all going to rent. So mm -hmm. the housing market could take years just to get back to normal levels of inventory, much less, you know, serious enough to climb, you know, so that that's a really interesting thing that we're experiencing in the housing market right now. But commercial is a whole different animal. Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. But do you think commercial, like considering like the super high rent growth from essentially people not being able to afford purchasing and kind of like inflation having a very dislocatory effect of sort uh, into like humongous rent growth. So do you feel like that may lead to perhaps bigger overvaluation in commercial real estate compared to, uh, or commercial multifamily compared to the general housing market? Because I feel like commercial investors, they tend to think commercial is safer and it has smaller declines because they're basing it off the global financial crisis. But that's just because global financial crisis single family was inflated. But they feel it could go the other way. Yeah. So multifamily is your safest, you know, mm -hmm. type of commercial real estate to invest in. It always has been. It's recession proof. People need a roof over their head. Mm -hmm. Rental housing is in the highest demand right now that it's been in a long time. Mm -hmm. Pressures on housing is, is putting that, you know, in demand. And we've seen record increase in rents, but we're also seeing pushback, you know, in some areas. People are moving. Uh, because they can't afford it. So the problem with that is, or the, the thing you got to weigh there from risk reward standpoint is you need to understand the income levels of your tenants and you can only push that so far. You start, what we've seen is it can be pushed a lot further than we thought, but normally it's about 30% of income. Now you're seeing people paying up to 40% of income and even more in some areas like the cities. People will pay 50% of their income to live in the city because they don't have to have cars and all these other things. But, you know, other areas that are suburban, you start pushing that threshold, people are going to move. You know, they just can't afford it and they're not going to be able to pay it. And we're seeing that happen. Now, the biggest risk to the rental 
um, market out there for investors is rent controls. A lot of cities and states are talking about rent controls and you know doing things to try to help people because it is getting pretty bad for a lot of people with their rents doubling and you know and more in some areas. So uh, you know again, it's going to be market specific. It's going to be asset specific, but right now there's still a big demand for rental, especially single family rents. I'm working with a lot of people doing build to rent communities. Um, uh, you know, from ground up development and as well as Airbnb. Um, but, you know, it's in big demand right now because, you know, people just don't want to pay for housing right now. And especially with interest rates where they are, uh, you know, the affordability uh, of that payment's been cut in half. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's, so, uh, Jimmy, I think you have a question. I do. Plus it is, uh, right after the BM, Airbnb built rent discussion. I know, right? He, he, yeah. he, he goes right into, into what yeah. I was uh, going to ask about. But oh, Greg, I, I had a, one more general question around capital raising, and I wanted you to put yourself in the shoes of somebody. So imagine starting from scratch, you have no network, you're in a foreign land. They speak English, though, so we'll make, we'll make it easy. What are the steps that you would actually do in terms of trying to get back to the level of success that you've had over the, the years you've been in the real estate if you had to start all over again? Yeah. So number one, you know, educate yourself. You have to be an expert in whatever it is you're raising capital for. So you need to know that business, know the uh, you know markets that you're in, things like that. That that's number one. Number two, you know, it is about your network. Your network is your net worth. But let's say you don't even have that ability. Now you have social media, where if you do accredited investors only, you can advertise. You can do general solicitation. So first and foremost, yourself. Second, the deal. You got to have a good deal. It has to be worthy of investment capital. And then three, leverage uh, technology and social media and advertise that deal. You can advertise it on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. And that's the game changer for a lot of people I work with is showing them how to put their deal out there to investors and raise, uh, raise that capital. So, you know, it's really a lot easier than it ever was before where I used to have to go and literally face to face and meet people and do that kind of thing. Yeah, let's take that a level deeper. So for social media, it's there particular channels that work better than others or is there a specific messaging that that uh, tends to work well yeah so facebook is obviously still number number one for that kind of thing twitter is uh, pretty good too if you pay attention to twitter you'll see uh one company and specifically that's uh advertising commercial grocery anchored centers to invest in but you know basically it's you know it's just putting the deal out there and you'll see them when you start looking at what i'm talking about you know, um, and you can target, you can say, hey, accredited investors, you know, and just, you know, talk about what the deal is or what the opportunity is that you have for them to invest in, whether it's a business or, um, you know, or a piece of real estate. But um, the key is, you know, just to put it out there, you know, there's no real targeted messaging. You know, the one thing, a couple of things you want to stay away from is, you know, don't try to offer or say that, you know, you're going to hit these obscene above average returns, you know, hey, 30% IRR, 40% IRR, mm -hmm. people, people know, you know, so I mean, 18 to 24% IRR, that's a great target, you know, 12 to 14% IRR, that's going to get people's attention, you know, that kind of thing, well located, good quality opportunity, uh, you know, to grow, you know, the income to grow the value of the asset, three to five year exit, you know, just little bullet points, that's it. And, uh, but the key is, is, you know, again, is just, you know, you got to make sure that you know what you're doing, you understand mm -hmm. the asset, you understand the business model. And, uh, you know, you're somebody that people can trust, you know, at the end of the day, because you're gonna have to talk to them at some point, you know, um, and the best way to do it is put that thing out there at scale, and then schedule investor webinars, like we're doing here, get everybody together, talk about the deal, answer questions, be honest, trustworthy, and, you know, know what you're doing. And you can hit the ground running and start doing big, big deals right now. Uh, there's people out there that will come alongside you and guarantee the loan. So if you don't have a net worth, so that's the other hindrance. It's not just raising the capital, but you got to have a net worth equal to the loan. And then you got to have liquidity, you know, of a year's worth of the payments, or sometimes they're going to want to see 10 to 20%, you know, uh, of the loan and liquidity, but you can find those people that will come alongside you and, and, you know, provide those and fill those holes in for you. So again, that's just putting it out there and letting people know. The other one is uh, Facebook groups. So those are powerful. You know, there's a lot of Facebook groups where people are looking to invest um, and are looking to come alongside people and act as a KP or a general partner to help them get a deal over the finish line. Nice. Thank you for sharing, Greg. Great. These are great, great suggestions. And actually, just uh, since you mentioned built to rent and we spoke about Bitcoin before, 
I've heard like some people refer to build to rent as kind of Bitcoin segment of the real estate market now. Is that kind of like a very hot um, segment and essentially a superior product to, to the rest of the market? Is that a position you share yourself or you know, perhaps not as far as Bitcoin, but still do you view it as a segment that has like larger potential than multifamily and other you know, more typical traditional sectors? So say that again. Yeah, I mean, I've heard this um, build to rent referred to as the build to rent, Bitcoin, okay. The Bitcoin segment of real estate, kind of. So yeah. Is that, yeah. Okay. So is that something that, like, what is your take on that? Mm -hmm. So when you say that, you mean network effect, right? So real estate yeah. syndication is the Bitcoin of the, you know, so it's all about network effect. There's nothing that's going to reach the exponential upside that Bitcoin saw. I mean, that's just phenomenal, right? 10 years going from zero to 69,000. I mean, yeah, obviously, like I said, there's real estate examples that you can see, but it's over 50 years, not over 10. But in terms of network effect, where everybody's excited about it, everybody's on, it's Airbnb, a lot of people doing short-term rentals, you know, build to rent is, you know, I mean, it's inefficient, you know, so it's, it's, it doesn't have the exponential ability that like a, you know, like a cryptocurrency has or anything like that. Real estate syndication is probably the most exponentially relation relatable one to a bitcoin because in real estate syndication you can do a hundred million dollar deal you know with nothing like yeah. you know right. Yeah. Right. yeah like we talked about a second ago you don't need any money That's you just true. need a deal and you put it out there and you bring all the pieces together and you can raise you know a couple hundred million bucks and do a hundred million dollar deal you know mm -hmm. you can do that yeah you, know, you just got to know what you're doing you need to understand what that looks like and believe it or not it's easier to get those bigger deals done than it is little deals mm -hmm. But yeah, that, that's interesting to me. And I remember the first time I ever heard about syndication, I was working with this couple and um, she was a, uh, her, the husband was a doctor, a physician. And, you know, she, I guess she was, she ran the practice with him, worked in the office or whatever. But anyways, they were investing money and doing things. And we were, we were doing some deals together. And then one day they told me, they said, yeah, we're investing in this, you know, really huge office complex, a hundred million dollar office complex. We're going to be partners. I'm like, how are you doing that? You know, it's the first time I've ever heard of syndication. You know, so people like to talk about it like it's a like, you know, like it's a, you know, a social thing, you know, it's uh like an icon. I see. Mm -hmm. You know, being part of those big deals like that. Yeah, yeah. It almost than... is. Yeah. I'm sorry to uh interrupt. It, it almost yeah. is when I'm speaking with people about syndications, mm -hmm. they I get responses like it's a Ponzi scheme. Why isn't everybody doing it? I'm like, everybody are doing it. Yeah, I can I, I can introduce you to like a hundred people that are doing it, uh, because it's just not typical, um, and they don't understand the returns. And even my friends who are in single family space, and I told them about bonus depreciation, they're like, "No, well, what does what does that even mean?" And then I explained, and their jaw just dropped. They they didn't get it. So it's it's a it's a big process. Even when it comes to uh, Airbnb, it's not as scalable as uh, multifamily or commercial. You know, all, all types of yeah. commercial. But you know, multifamily is the safest. That's why it gets the most attention, and that's why the cap rates are so compressed. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, so, Greg, what is the best way for people to reach to you? I think we had like some amazing discussion here today and questions and really appreciate taking the time yeah absolutely i appreciate you having me and before i go i'll just you know leave yeah. one thing with everybody like i said in the beginning you know you have no limitations if you fully embrace that and receive that you have no limitations you can do these big deals you can do whatever you want you gotta educate yourself you gotta learn the process and you gotta understand the markets but there's no limitations so don't limit yourself we're in the biggest, best opportunity we've ever been in, in the history of the economic history of this country. And it's going to come back around this little bottom that we're in right now. <laughs> even if we go down further, whatever, it's going to turn back around. And when that bull cycle comes back on, it's going to be just like it was the last two or three years. It's going to be phenomenal. So don't limit yourself. Don't think you can't do it just because it's got four or five zeros behind it and you've never done it. There's no difference between doing a hundred thousand dollar house and doing a hundred million dollar building other than obviously the size of the property, but it's, you know, if it's, if it's a multifamily or rental property, it's income and expenses. If it's a hundred million dollar building, it's still rent coming in and expenses going out to operate it. 
if it's a $1,200 a month house, it's income coming in and expenses to operate it. Taxes, insurance, maintenance, same thing. There's no difference. So just, you know, take that with you and whatever it is you've been thinking, man, I'd really love to go do this. I just don't know how. I just told you how. Educate yourself, put your deal out there in front of people and just don't let anything stop you. Just remember, there are no limitations. Just go do whatever it is you want to do. So that's, uh, I'll leave you with that. And, uh, you know, my website's gregdickerson.com. You can find my YouTube channel link there. I've got a ton of content on my YouTube channel and all that. And uh, that's what I'll leave you with. Awesome. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, good to see y'all. Thanks, everyone. Thank everyone you. Yeah, bye-bye. Thanks, Greg. Steph. All right, Jimmy, take care.